Um, hopefully, we'll be able to have a lively discussion to match the, the oh, lunch yeah, presentation that we just, just have. Maybe not so much debate, but we'll cover some interesting topics. So I'm Pleasure. My name is Michael Bennett. I'm with the Stanford Global Project Center. Um, it's my pleasure to be joined by Ilan Gurr from Cyclotron Ventures, Gabriel Croft from um, Prelude Ventures, and Marianne Wu from General Electric Ventures. Uh, here to talk about investing in uh, clean energy technologies. Um, and so uh, how I'd like to kind of format, we, ha we started a few minutes late, so we got about an hour um, to cover a, a pretty wide variety of topics uh, this afternoon. Uh, but what I'd like to do is maybe uh, uh, give each of the panelists to start an opportunity to kind of introduce their organization, how they invest in the, the, the type of new ventures that they invest in and kind of where in the technology spectrum that they target. Uh, and then I have a few questions that I'd like to kind of send down the line to, to start the conversation. Uh, and then we'll also open it up for questions from the audience. So if you do have questions, uh, we, I think we have some volunteers with microphones, if you can just raise your hand. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. So great, and may, so maybe we can start with Alon if you want to introduce your organization. Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is mic on? Yeah. I think you need to Mike? point here. How about now? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Uh, so my name is Elon Gurr. Uh, I'm the director of a program called Cyclotron Road. Uh, we are not a venture group. Uh, we are a very unique accelerator incubator program uh, focused exclusively on providing a home that empowers and enables hard technology entrepreneurs and innovators to get started uh, um, in building transformative energy companies based on technology. Uh, the, the framing, well, so what we do at Cyclotron Road is, is we provide some seed capital to allow innovators to go all in on their projects. Uh, we give them access to one of the world premier R&D laboratories. Uh, we host our program at Berkeley, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, about a billion dollar a year research laboratory, so we give them access to the facilities and the expertise there. And then we provide uh, a mentored experience um, with both education and mentorship around hard tech entrepreneurship, as well as a network and an ecosystem of folks who have experience and interest in supporting hard materials, chemistry, and manufacturing technologies. The, the basic motivation around what we're doing is pretty straightforward, and I think we'll will resonate with folks here in Silicon Valley. Uh, we love Silicon Valley because basically we can create an enormous amount of impact and wealth with innovation. Uh, it turns out if you're an innovator uh, whose innovation is based on a software or digital technology, there aren't a lot of barriers to getting started. Right? You have your idea, uh, you can go prototype uh, pretty easily with a small group of people without a lot of capital. If you get some early traction, there is a very strong ecosystem and a very clear model on how to scale those businesses. You can get that investment and, and build that to scale. We're around because if you're the type of entrepreneur or innovator who has, again, a chemistry and materials innovation, no matter how good that idea is, the barrier to getting started is much higher. Largely because you need a different set of expertise and you need some sophisticated facilities and infrastructure to get started. You need a lab. So in that case, it might, instead of raising 50 to or $100,000 as a seed, you probably need closer to a million dollars or more to go build your research tools. That will probably take you at least a year to get someone to commit that much money for a very early stage project, if you even can. You might not and walk away. If you can, a year in, you're now setting up a lab, it's probably a year and a half before you're actually getting any learning cycles. That might be one or one and a half percent of your life before you've even gotten started, right? Once you get that investment or that early ability to get started, you have the issue that most of the resources out there, you go to any blog on entrepreneurship, tend to be catered to software um, and you know, not necessarily physical science-based technologies. So the educational system, the network of supporters, and certainly the network of financiers, and I think that'll be the topic of this panel, uh, is much more fragmented, and we're trying to bring all of that together. Hey there. Uh, thanks for having me on the panel. My, my name is Gabriel Kra, and I work at Prelude Ventures. Uh, Prelude is a venture firm, and we invest exclusively in companies that 
when successful, will reduce net CO2 in the atmosphere or CO2 equivalents. Um, that is definitely for us a mission-driven thing. You know, we, we, we talk about that, we believe it, we, we support the community in lots of ways. But as a venture firm, for us, that's just the sandbox that we play in. That's where we invest. So if you come to us, you know, a lot of things will sort of say this is carbon reducing, it's solar, it's wind, it's storage, you know, and we'll, we'll do it. Other things, we'll have to have a debate or a thought process, uh, and we'll, we'll say, does this fit in our mandate? Because we want to be able to define that pretty broadly. Um, and so we include things that some people see as obvious and others don't. We can happy to discuss that at some other point. But then once, you know, once you've sort of passed through those, those gate posts, you know, then it becomes a venture decision. Um, venture has not necessarily been the most successful industry for venture has not been energy tech and hard science tech uh, in this sector for, for some fairly good reasons. Uh, and also because some mistakes were made in applying venture models to these things, both, both things. But one of the key things that where we are different from a traditional venture firm is we have an evergreen fund and we have a flexible mandate on how we can invest into our companies. Um, so evergreen is important. If we like an opportunity and we like a group of entrepreneurs, that means that we can invest, you know, three, four, five years into our fund life on something that might be a 10 or 12 or 15 year time horizon company, right? That, that's important in these, in many of our sectors and industries. The flexibility of our mandate also allows us to invest both very early, you know, seed stage investments, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to a to some really good entrepreneurs with a great idea or an interesting idea, maybe it's not a great idea, um, but also to do tens of millions of dollars into the same company later in its life cycle. So you know, if we go early, it's because we want to help a team figure something out and, it, and if it works, wonderful, and, if it, and we'll continue to invest and if it doesn't work, hopefully they'll move on to something that, that will work in the future. Um, so we will invest across the life cycle uh, of the companies that we invest in. And then sort of, of how we invest, once it's passed through that, <coughs> that, um, that gate post, we really want to see, you know, sure, we, we, we can, in some cases, in software-related things and in service, you know, in, 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 data, in some data-driven <coughs> companies, you can see a, a pretty well-defined, well-trod pathway of, of, to liquidity in some time horizon. Uh, otherwise, though, what, what we really want to see is what, what is this money going to do? You know, what risk is it going to take out? What problem is it going to prove is no longer a problem? What market risk or market uncertainty is it going to validate? Um, and, and we try and you know, say, okay, we'll, we, we can do this equity investment to get you to this next gatepost. And I think the gateposts of value creation are different in, in, in these industries a lot of times than they are in traditional IT-related uh, ventures. Um, and then, I, 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 we, I could go on for <laughs> way too long, so I'll say one last thing about how we invest. We're really cognizant that this, this is very hard. All venture, you know, all new venture creation is hard. Uh, there, there are some places where this is even more difficult than a software or IT-driven uh, venture, and so we really do look really hard for teams who, you know, it, it's an art, not a science, but for teams who, you know, we think are not going to stop when they fail the first, or when, when they get their first setback or their second or their third, they're going to keep going for it and keep, you know, trying to figure out how to solve tough market, regulatory, technical problems um, with, with, within the confines of what they're trying to do. That's very good. Yes. Um, so I'm Marianne Wu. Uh, I'll start by saying I'm a Stanford alum, so uh, delighted to be <laughs> back on campus, and thanks for having me. Uh, I lead the Energy and Intelligent Environments Investing Team at GE Ventures. I'll come back to what that means in a second. GE, I think most of you probably know, is a large diversified industrial. Um, in the energy space, I think we're quite unique. We have um, businesses across a pretty broad spectrum of the energy market, including oil and gas, and then really all aspects of the electricity value chain. So we have traditional centralized generation, we have large renewable business, we have a significant grid business, and late last year we also launched a business going behind the meter into commercial and industrial customers. So very unusual, I think, in the breadth of that platform. 
Um, from a venture's perspective, we invest for uh, we invest like a typical corporate investor. We invest for strategic and financial return. Um, in many ways, I think that's similar to what you just said, Gabriel, that there has to be some strategic benefit that uh, acts as a guidepost in terms of whether it fits into the investment lens or not. Um, and that can be a very close and tangible, like we think that there is, a, there is already, or we think there is a a strong commercial engagement that can occur with our business units, and that can be about uh, broadening our solution breadth, increasing time to market, or something fairly tangible like that. Or it can be much more uh, abstract and nebulous in the sense that uh, the company is developing technology or pioneering in a market that we think is really interesting as a market that we might want to participate in downstream and just want to learn about. Once we kind of understand the strategic fit, it does go back to classic um, financial investing. We are measured on financial returns. Um, it is not the primary purpose, certainly, of the ventures business in the sense that GE has many ways to make money, and venture investing would not be a primary uh, priority for the company at that level. But uh, GE is a very hard-nosed business, and if you're not making money as a division, then you don't get to survive. And so that financial return certainly is an important part of our charter as well. Um, we do, uh, unlike a lot of um, venture firms, we do also engage very deeply, and I, I know you're going to come back to this later, very deeply with the businesses. And so we have worked quite closely with them, uh, and, and this is a, a relatively recent phenomenon, but we work quite closely with them on how they could disrupt themselves and new business models and new technologies. And a lot of that's informed by what we're seeing outside. And then that disrupting of themselves can be, now we do that in partnership with third party companies. That can be, as we did last year, launching of a new business inside of GE. We call it a startup, but it's a billion dollar startup. Um, and this is current, that, that I was referring to, the current powered by GE. Um, which is a behind-the-meter business. And that was something we felt we weren't doing in a concerted way inside of GE. There was a new opportunity, and that Ventures had a very strong arm, a hand in, in creating that new platform. So we work quite closely with the business units in terms of uh, strategic direction. Uh, from an investment perspective, um, you know, we are fairly broad. We can play across the spectrum, so we do early stage, Series A, and sometimes do seed, although certainly not the main. Uh, and we have gone very late stage as well. Uh, in the main, we are ser Series B, C type investors. So if you translate that through, it means that there is some kind of product, that there is maybe early commercial revenue as a stage that we like to, uh, we typically would enter at. But again, the spectrum can be very large. Um, uh, you know, this panel is certainly focused on energy. Um, but just maybe quickly, um, we do, as an investing practice, also do investment in health healthcare uh, and a number of things around advanced manufacturing and supply chain and logistics. Great. Um, well, so I had a, a few questions or, or topics to maybe throw down the line to kind of get the conversation um, started before we kind of turn it over to the audience. Um, so, so my research program at, at Stanford, so at, at the Global Project Center, we. Uh, broadly speaking, I conduct research on how institutional capital can get to kind of strategic assets and infrastructure in more aligned ways. Um, and so that's kind of a broad spectrum, but by, by that I mean kind of the, you know, hundred trillion dollars of institutional capital that exists in public pension funds, private pension funds, insurance companies, endowments like the one across the street, and of how that capital source can get to infrastructure assets and as that applies to energy in a lot of cases how that institutional capital can get around technology risk. Um, and so one kind of obser observation that I wanted to make and kind of a, a trend as we kind of lay out the spectrum of uh, energy, technology, risk and investing uh, as it exists today is that uh, that hundred trillion dollars for a little while, a small portion of it was uh, getting into technology risk in that about a decade ago or so there was uh, a lot of closed end venture capital funds who were raising capital from our, our public pensions and other institutional investors and they had kind of clean tech investing programs and that they made their foray 
And I think now, just as an anecdotal observation, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, some of that capital is now kind of withdrawn from the market. And as an observation, I think as we kind of span really the technology development spectrum here with the panel today, uh, there are no closed-end venture capital uh, funds, you know, on the panel today. Um, and so I, you know, I think just kind of going down the line, I, you know, it'd be great for me to hear, and I'm sure it'd be great for the audience to hear, kind of how the energy investment and energy tech investment technology, how that, how that spectrum has kind of evolved over the last decade and will there be a, will there be a, uh, an, uh, an arm of, some, of Sand Hill Road or your know, more traditional uh, venture capital funds being back in the energy space or, or did it really ever leave and maybe we could just start from one end if you have any thoughts on that topic more broadly. Well, I mean, what came to mind for me, at Cyclotron Road we focused at the very, very, very beginning of this process. We're you know, super early, the, we run a competition every year and bring in what we think are the best kind of hard energy technology innovators from across the country and beyond in some cases, um, largely because they don't have a way to get started with these projects. <clears throat> Almost proto companies, right? There's no question in our mind that when you think about what it takes, I, I think everyone on the panel would agree, there's an enormous opportunity and a need to disrupt and transform the energy infrastructure system in this country beyond Right? When you think about how to go do that, there's no question in our mind that most of the issues and the risk and the hard part of that is way downstream. Right? And so some people would say, well, why even bother seeding these things if, if you can't solve the downstream? And, and the way we look at it is I think we're still very early in our learning cycle on how to move technology from an idea into a widespread market impact. I think. Gabriel, you know, the word he used, which was, you know, we went through an experimental cycle here in the Valley where I think mm -hmm. the traditional venture scaling model for companies was applied, and I think many would argue misapplied, to a lot of very hard energy technology companies and ideas that were at a very early stage. And the way I like to think about this, you know, at Cyclotron Road, we have sort of a fundamental belief, which is if you get the best innovators in the world, and you give them a platform that gives them the resources they need to create value with technology, and you surround them with you know, a network and mentorship, and you give them some time, those people will create value with technology. There's no question about it, right? They'll have a chance to create IP, create knowledge both about the science and the technology risks, but also about the markets. Um, understand, you know, build a team. There is value in all of that. We tend to think that there's a, there's a full spectrum in terms of how any one technology might move to market and how that value might be brought to market, might be extracted by the marketplace. If you think of that large spectrum, traditional venture capital as a financing model is one very, very narrow slice of the spectrum. Right? And so I like to say that you know, ten, over the last you know, 10 to 15 years, we crammed all of the early stage technology innovators and innovations into this narrow slice model and I'd argue that most likely, if with the benefit of hindsight, probably only maybe 5% of the things that we seeded with venture in hard energy technology were appropriate for that financing model. So what we try and think about, and I think what you see happening in the financial landscape right now, is to say, if there is a broader opportunity set in terms of how we create value, Let's start to explore financial structures that can support and bring value across that spectrum. Um, and I do still think there are great opportunities for traditional venture to be applied to energy technologies, even some of the hardest energy technologies. But there are certain ingredients you need. You need some very strong premium first markets that can get you a foothold and scale and, and go beyond that. But there are these other opportunities, and we think a lot about corporations, um, right? If, if the risk is downstream, it's balance sheet risk, it's execution risk, it's distribution channels risks, those are things that big corporations have, right? So there's, there should be a marrying there that can happen. Um, sometimes the risk is that the institutional capital cycle doesn't have the time horizon, doesn't have the right aligned incentives. All right, we have new financial vehicles. I, I, to, I feel like we've that. sort of gone straight into the right, nitty-gritty yeah, of this and that we maybe lost a little bit of background. So I, I, first of all, I feel like 
we have already convolved energy investing with hard science investing. And I don't think they're the same thing, right? Absolutely. I think they have a strong correlation in the sense that if you have, you know, a fundamental battery breakthrough, a solar breakthrough, a nuclear break breakthrough, that's definitely part of energy investing. But a lot of energy investing doesn't have to be hard science. And so the mix of the two, I think, is where sometimes we get the conversation a little bit confused. Um, so that's one. That's right. yep. uh, and so kind of going back to your original question, you, you kind of framed it around that, right? Mm -hmm. That there was a lot of hard science investing and that, uh, and that we don't do that anymore. And, and maybe we take that as the first point and, and go, I don't know, bit by bit from there. So hard science investing, uh, I do think, has fallen off, right? And I think that's part of what you're doing, Elon, yep. is sort of trying to bridge that gap of, of how do you at least get that started. Um, and certainly, you know, I think the Valley was originally built on hard science investing. I think circa 2000, I don't know, pick your time frame, 2005 through 2000, to the early, mid 2000s, right? There was a lot of investing that followed that same basic model um, that, oh, if I have some great technology breakthrough that's IP defensible, this is my road to riches and I'm gonna do, um, uh, I'm going to build the semiconductor industry over again in energy, and I'm going to build the biotech industry and the pharmaceutical life sciences industry over again in the biofuel side of the, the house. And that's what you did see in 2006, 2007, when you saw a lot of Sand Hill Road investing around uh, these technologies. And I think, Gabriel, you made the point that uh, that didn't work out so well. We know, right, that didn't work out so well. A lot of those investments did not work out so well. And, and I think one of the fundamental things that um, was not well understood, it, it, which is fundamentally obvious, right, in retrospect, was that um, whereas in those other markets, in pharmaceuticals and in IT, you had early markets that would pay a lot of, for functionality. So if you got something to work, somebody would pay a lot of money for it. Then you could get to manufacturing scale and it could be cheap, right? But if you just got it to work at some manufacturing throughput, that was valuable in itself. And in energy markets, nobody cares until you're economically viable. And so the problem with these hard science technologies in energy is largely that problem of not the overall capital required, but how much capital is required before you can show that you've done anything useful. And so a lot of the money that went in in sort of 2000, that 2000 time frame, was highly misguided. I think that, um, and then there's sort of these backlash effects that happen, right? So then people feel like, ah, it doesn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. Quite honestly, I think Solyndra was very negative. You had to say, like nobody asked. You didn't have to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it caused, like, it caused a whole sort of sentiment, right, around, oh, this just doesn't work. Like this was just a fundamentally bad idea. We, we can't do anything in energy. And I think your question sort of brings back some of those tones because it's all about hard science. Mm -hmm. There were actually a number of investments made during that time that weren't about hard science. They were quite successful. And so, um, you know, Solar City, O-Power, these are energy companies. They are more... Um, business model oriented, they are maybe more software oriented. They, were, they had the elements in place that you could build a business that was commercially viable quickly rather than having to do, depend on a lot of um, uh, scale effects, uh, fundamental technology effects. And, and so I think that's one big change that has occurred. The, the other thing I would say is that there are actually closed-in funds that are doing venture yeah. investing. Mm -hmm. um, they may not be as much, uh, you know, Kleiner is certainly still doing it, Kozla is still doing it, so the big names are, are NEA, uh, so the big names are still involved. Uh, but you also have, uh, particularly now, the emergence of a number of new funds emerging that are focused on energy uh, with particular uh, focus areas, uh, geographic, um, whatever it might be, but there's, you're seeing a new set of funds emerge. So to, to just take up on that point, there was a cycle. There was certainly an early effort, you know, something like 2004, it started by 2006 or seven, every firm on Sand Hill Road had a partner doing energy tech investing of some stripe or another. Uh, a lot of that investing was informed by a model that said, you know, you get to this first viable product and then you pour a lot of money into sales and manufacturing and the thing takes off and, you know, your, your, your wins pay for your portfolio very, very nicely and that model didn't work. And then that was coupled to the Great Recession and so 
firms you know, were suddenly told by their investors, why the heck are you losing this money in this sector that you're not good at? Go back to what you've proven you can do. Uh, and then, you know, then came this latest sort of boom of sort of more software and consumer oriented uh, uh, investing, which has become at least on paper and in some instances actually realized very profitable for traditional venture investing. But that, that cycle, you know, two years ago, I, I didn't think that that cycle was really beginning to come out of the bottom, but now there are new firms coming. There are uh, generalist firms that are returning to energy technology in some way or another, and there are new firms popping up that are, have that as a big part of their core, you know, where they want to invest. So, you know, things come and things go. It's, it's sort of a generic answer, but it, it, things true. are, yeah, things are cyclical. And, they're, they're, you know, you don't have to be, you know, um, an industry specialist to invest only, you know, to invest in this industry. I think it's helpful. Um, what, one of the other things, you know, that, that Marianne pointed out, hard science does seem to have fallen off. It's much easier... The barriers to invest it, to creating a company, a software company, are incredibly much lower. I think everybody in this audience has probably heard this. They're incredibly much lower from a financial perspective of, of what dollars you need to develop a product and get it out there in some way and prove that there's something that merits greater investment, right? And you can do that on like $500,000 is all it takes to do what took five to $10 million 10 years ago because you don't have to buy servers, you don't have to buy a lot of equipment, you don't have to have a huge office, you can have a, you know, five or 10 people working on laptops you know, in, in a shared workspace. I, I think it's the capital intensive, right. well, it's the sort of friction to start, right. right? But it's also the potential impact, right? So it's not just that, oh, hey, it's really easy to get going. It's that the impact of what you're doing can be very large. Or the fin impact not in a financial sense. In a financial and real sense. So um, if, you, if you kind of bring this back um, to GE, I sit here as GE, so I represent GE. Right? We're like fundamentally a company that makes equipment. We make heavy equipment. We are proudest to sort of one of the things that we like to brag about the most is GRC, our global research center, which, and we're one of the few firms uh, that has, still has a large global research center full of PhDs doing hard science in thermodynamics or material systems or wh whatever. Um, and at the same time, you, I, I mean, many of you have probably seen our commercials with, you know, um, sort of, oh, I'm a coder. Uh, but there is, and it, that's not just to be hip and cool and try and, like, recruit people, right? That there's a very real opportunity in applying IT into traditional industry, which is largely untouched by the advances right. in IT. Right. So you have the fact that, you know, consumer and enterprise back office have been fundamentally transformed by, by an IT revolution. Um, that has, you know, changed uh, the hoteling industry, has changed the car industry, has changed the way real business is conducted. And at the same time, in these traditional industries, you have workers running around with clipboards and transcription. You have assets that can't tell you anything about how they're operating, so you don't know how to schedule maintenance. You're not coordinating your supply chain. And so there's real economic impact that's delivered from that that has huge energy impact, right? Because you run your, you run your operations more efficiently. That's always your lowest hanging fruit on energy. And so the impact from an energy perspective of applying digital is huge, and I think that's the other thing you're seeing. It's easier from a capital perspective, but you also have um, real contribution that can be financially rewarded. Well, I, I, can I make two quick points? And one of these things is something that Ilan and I have discussed and discussed years ago, right? Two, three, before he started uh, Cyclotron Road. And that's in IT, in software, and in you know, sort of the app-driven economy you can be 22 and start on this career of startups. And even if your first and your second don't succeed, at some point you, you're going to succeed. And there's this universe of people you know, who have money from Google and Twitter and PayPal and all these successful places who will invest $50,000, $100,000 in your venture. And if you're decent, eventually you're going to have a, you know, a million or $2 million or $5 million payday. That, that doesn't mean you sold your company or went public. That just means like you got this aqua hire model for $20 or $30 million. 
And while $5 million sounds like a lot of money to a, a, a founder, if somebody's really been doing it for 10 years and they're a great software engineer, they could have been making that money somewhere else you know, and, and made that same amount of money over that time period. But what it means is that those entrepreneurs can do that, can try and fail and try and fail, and know that they've got a career where they're not putting their financial future at risk. There's this model. And, and in energy tech, where you can try for 10 years and end up with zero, um, and the economics of what it takes to get a venture across the finish line mean that for the earliest of investors, there's no return unless they take it all from the entrepreneur. Well, then you need things like Cyclotron Road. You need other ways of launching companies so that people come out of it sort of past that first seed stage, having held on to a decent portion of their company. Otherwise, as a young entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's hard to get into this field. Right, so that yeah. was something that I remember us talking about over coffee or something yeah. harder years ago, right? And yeah. thinking yeah. there must be a solution somewhere. And I, I, you know, I think, Marianne, you, you raised a good point, right? Which is, and my, I live in this kind of hard science, hard tech world. There is no question that an enormous amount of impact can be made in computing. And I was thinking, you know, one of the sort of architects with me of the Cyclotron Road program is Mark Johnson, who's sitting here in the audience. Um, were partially supported by the Department of Energy. Mark is the head of the advanced manufacturing program for DOE, you know, hard manufacturing technologies. And what he will tell you is probably the biggest opportunities in transforming manufacturing are digital technologies, right? right? It has to do with, right, 3D printing is more of a computational algorithm problem than, and a big data problem than it is a hardware problem. And you censor a manufacturing line, the throughput advances you can have there are enormous, so, yeah, right? And I think that is a very, very, very important point. I, I guess I'd give a perspective, and, and one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because when I sit and watch a debate you know, by Burt Richter and Steve Chu and these folks, and I think about the solutions when they talk about the next 50 years and 100 years, a lot of those solutions really are physical. How do we transform our physical infrastructure? Yeah. And I had this really interesting moment. I was at a conference, I can't even remember where, but, but Tim Warner, who's the CEO of SunPower, right, one of the most successful solar companies that really drove that revolution, was talking about the future of SunPower. And you know, there was the full disclosure up front, and then he talked about the opportunities for the business, and he talked about how solar is going to be a trillion dollar business. And almost everything he talked about from a technology standpoint and an innovation standpoint was soft, software. It was about customer acquisition, it was about distribution, um, new models for demand response, et cetera. And, and I sat there and said, wow, solar is a trillion dollar opportunity in industry, and SunPower has all these opportunities, but let's all remember that SunPower would not exist if a guy named Dick Swanson didn't quit his job here at Stanford as a professor in physics <laughs> to go start a company in solar, right, at a time where that transformation wasn't really imaginable. So that, that's why the focus, at least for me, on, on that piece, and I think we're, we're totally diverging here. Um, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, Go ahead. something else you said and you followed up on also that we've found is things that we take for granted here about software and about data and big data and machine learning tools um, are, are really foreign to much, many industries and many segments of the economy that have that, where they can have huge impacts. And we've got two companies in our portfolio um, that we've figured out are actually big data and machine learning companies that are taking those tools to industries that haven't seen them. Um, you know, literally one is just how do you make develop materials better and how do you have a more informed uh, opinion about where to focus your development efforts and then the same tools that that data analytics and, and it's a machine learning and a big data set and applying it across, you know, tools that are very known here but aren't known where Fortune 500 companies started out like, oh, you can't do that for us. We know how to do this. Uh, and then, you know, after a first engagement, they're like, oh, wow, we didn't think of that. That's great. And signing a much longer term deal with us. And so th that company just raised its A round with us and you know, very traditional software data focused investors, right? Uh, another company did some, discovered something similar in the ag space. It was, it was using, it for, using these tools for its own purposes, working with big ag companies and those companies saying, hey, can we, can we use that tool? That's really cool. And, and, and 
from our perspective, it's sort of hard to believe that those tools are, are what they found novel, but you can do this. You can take these tech tools and apply them to other industries where, where they're not as commonplace. I think one thing that's great, just a quick, a quick point, I think one thing that's great as I hear Marianne and Gabriel talk is we talk a lot about the past and how people invested in the space. And one thing we tell our entrepreneurs is, yes, the ecosystem looks different and in some ways that's harder. But by the way, you know, you have the benefit and the ecosystem has the benefit of seeing that movie play out and whether you're innovating on software or the intersection of software materials or materials, you have the chance to be a lot smarter and not walk down yeah. a path that ultimately is gonna kill yeah. you. Um, and then the question is, are there enough of those paths to walk down? Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I think just, we clearly have gone a Go long ahead. time yeah, on one yeah, question. Yeah. But, but one thing, um, because what we've sort of set up the storyline, right, is 2005, lots of enthusiasm, and then we sort of set up the cratering. Uh, but, but, but I think that what we didn't sort of finish that storyline with is that, that there is, I think, a tremendous resurgence going on. And I think that we're in the early days of that resurgence. So if you look kind of 2005, it was all enth enthusiasm. Uh, we went into sort of a cycle of policy uncertainty that was, I think, uh, counterproductive. Uh, but it was sort of investment in advance a little bit. If you flash forward to today, you're seeing very profound effects of energy change and disruption occurring. Right. It's not sort of hypothetical anymore, all right? Real things are happening. In, in Europe, the utilities are actually splitting apart because distributed generation is so significant right. Right. and it's changing the entire structure of their energy industry, the business models that go with it. It's not hypothetical, it's not something that's coming, it's something that happened and impacted billion, multi-billion dollar market cap companies, right? You look at GE, we launched current, we started a new business unit to go after a market segment that, uh, that we didn't serve before because distributed generation is absolutely here and customers as taking a real role in what the energy infrastructure looks like is not hypothetical, it is very much here. And large companies that are in the main conservative have voted with their organization structure that this is here and now. So I, I think that's something that's fundamentally changed. I do also think that this kind of new evolution of, oh yes, there's this whole IT in, in for, you know, revolution that occurred that didn't touch industrial has kind of created that cross section too, where a lot of people are rushing in, or rushing in I think is way too strong, but very <laughs> intrigued by the idea that you could really unlock new kind of, um, the market, the, not the market, the, the real productivity gains that you could deliver through applying IT into industrial sector is enormous. And there is, I think, a belief that there is more economic opportunity that startups can go after. So I think those things are really bringing back, and, and, and more policy support, maybe, interest, right? Let, let's call it that there seems to be some agreement, at least, that we want to take action. Um, so I think a, a few of those things are coming together to really stimulate a lot more interest. My, my greatest fear is that entrepreneurs don't know so one of the things that I worry about is large companies know because we feel this and we're, we're deep in it. And entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley kind of hanging out, sort of saying, ah, oh, that sort of, that end 2000 sector, that didn't go so well. My fear is that entrepreneurs don't know. And there is a ton of opportunity if you can apply, if you can go after these markets that are fundamentally in transition right now. No, that's that's great, great. I, I love the the dialogue on on the, the first question. <laughs> uh, so I had one more question to maybe uh, run by the group, <laughs> and, then we're out of time. Uh, but, and then hopefully we'll still have some time for some questions for the audience too. But uh, <clears throat> you know, the other kind of observation I wanted to to make about this great panel is that it really does span the development spectrum to a lot more on the applied research side, kind of into prototyping and then Gabriel kind of spanning uh, or able to span several sectors and then all the way down to kind of almost the corporate venture uh, end of the spectrum. And so, and to kind of uh, get ahead of some potential questions from the audience, of course, at one of these panels, one of the questions is wh where are you looking, what subsectors, what specific technologies um, uh, are, are currently of interest or more recently areas in which you want to look. And I'm particularly interested with this group to see if we're going to have, we're going to follow the development spectrum as we go across the panel or if maybe there's, there's some overlap mm -hmm. in terms of uh, some specific subsectors, maybe one or two 
uh, from each of you that's currently or more recently of interest. I'd be always. Sorry. I'm going to end up sidestepping this question, so let's come <laughs> back to me so that people aren't disappointed right away. Great, Gabe. Well, I, I've already alluded to one. You know, we sort of, and maybe it's not a sector, but a theme. Uh, with those two companies I mentioned, the first one was Citrine, which is doing sort of big data and data analytics for Citrine informatics to, to, for, you know, for materials. And then there's all sorts of applications within a big company of how you can use this tool. And then the other one was a company called Benson Hill, which does, has some really sophisticated data analytics tools for, for developing um, new traits in, in plants for agriculture. And, and what we saw is if you have a really good team that, that knows one specific industry or sector uh, that ha can take these tools and, and build a product that is useful, um, you, you, you can actually create a pretty lucrative business model. So sort of taking that big data and uh, machine learning and data analytics capabilities and applying them in places where they haven't been applied, to your point. That's a theme where I don't think that's a sector, right? Um, you know, we've done a, you know, food and ag is a place where we think there's still a lot of room both for financial returns and for impact on, on a carbon basis. Uh, and so we keep looking there. We have three or four recent investments there, but I, I'm not sure we're done there. Um, uh, we're, 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 frankly, we're a little behind the curve on transportation um, because we never quite found the team and the opportunity we like we, we liked. And, and shame on us because there's been some wonderful companies. So we're, we're definitely working on that. Um, I'd say that's enough for now. We, we also tend to just be really opportunistic. You know, we we have a company in the mining industry, and, and it was just this team that was able to tell us this story that was so compelling on energy savings and and value creation in the mining industry with a new technology and a combination. Uh, and in retrospect, it was data analytics, but with some new sensor technologies that we we took a chance, and it's really working out well. So we try to be opportunistic too. Great. Um. Uh, we invest, lots of things are interesting. I'll, I'll try and uh, focus my comments uh, a little bit. Um, uh, one area that we're certainly spending a lot of time is this idea of now distributed resources and certainly making them dynamic, right? So volatility in, uh, is a real problem and opportunity. <coughs> and I think the potential for end customers to engage much more actively, certainly around generation, but also around their own load management and being much more uh, active in that. And so this idea of distributed resources, coordination of those distributed resources and two-way grid overall is a big bucket for us. Uh, and there can be hardware investments in that, there can be software investments in that, and I think a lot of them are frankly combinations of both, right? So I think sometimes when people hear software, they assume it's just an app or, or something, but software I think is often fundamentally part of, is, is a key value of a bigger system. Uh, at Stanford, I think there's a program called Bits and Watts. Uh, yes, Bits and Watts, which I think uh, says that exactly right, right? That the bits are part of delivering the watts. It's not one or the other. There's a system that comes together. Um, so this idea of sort of dynamic resources, two-way grid is a very active area for us. Um, as part of that, the end customer, I think, is increasingly important in a lot of these industries where it might have been centralized before and you sold to a single concentrated point, is distributed resources, is distributed customer sets. And so I think that's, that's uh, good, I think, in the sense that you can have faster time to market because they can act faster. It also, I think, gives the opportunity for broader value propositions beside, behind the, uh, than just energy. And I think one of the problems of calling things energy investing or clean tech investing is it really narrows the aperture in that somehow it's just, you know, you, you deliver an energy value proposition. And if you look at what we're talking about, which is some, some of this is around sensors and data, then a large part of this sort of big disruption we're seeing is combining many sources of data to do many different things. And, and so an energy saving proposition can be part of something else. So if I want to run my building better, I want to save energy, I want to run my manufacturing floor better, I want my employees to be happier, I want my customers to be happier. There's a whole set of things I'm trying to do in running that building. There's no reason to constrain your mindset just to the energy side of the equation. And so, so I think that's also something that we're increasingly seeing is that an energy or a company that delivers energy benefit for us 
is really delivering a broader set of, uh, a broader set of benefits that speeds up customer acquisition. Um, the other thing, uh, <coughs> I think the, the other sort of side that we're spending a bunch of time on is uh, oil and gas and productivity enhancements, again, mainly around, in that one, mainly around digital uh, and a, a digital machines, maybe, in terms of uh, advanced drilling techniques that have much more sensoring and cap uh, sensoring feedback, uh, rock characterization, seismic, or other. Um, but the idea of how do you use digital and um, information to drive greater productivity of these, these actual resources. Great. One, yeah. yeah, so I mean, I, I flippantly said <laughs> I'm going to sidestep the question. It's, it's largely because what areas we're interested, it doesn't compute for me because, you know, we're all the way at the front end of this. And for better or worse, we kind of have a belief that at the very beginning, you know, ideas aren't valuable, right? Value creation starts with a person or a group of people and they go build the value. They go find the ideas. Um, so our process basically is selecting for very talented people who are technically strong enough to go build a team and execute on a vision building technology, but who are also entrepreneurial enough and, and can learn to adapt and figure out where the value is and where the opportunity is. Um, so that, that's our process, but what I'll say, and specifically around this, this panel on financing, this idea of trying to tap into a spectrum of different modes of financing different business models was something we had when we started Cyclotron Road, we ran a pilot, we brought in six project teams um, that fit the bill in terms of quality of people about a year and a half ago. And what's been interesting is, as we fast forwarded over the year and a half, what we've realized is of those six, there are two projects that are very clearly matched to a traditional venture model. They're still early, they're still hard technologies, but they have a venture story. And those two are now being courted by venture capitalists to fund their first round. One, just as an example in terms of areas, uh, is developing a thermionic heat engine. Uh, an ability to make a, basically, the most efficient heat engine in the sub-megawatt scale that could exist, you know, in terms of physics. Um, and they came in and we thought the big, the big disruption here is essentially distributed generation. You know, 100 kilowatt scale at your house, whatever, extremely efficient, silent, no moving parts. It turned out very quickly they learned that actually the value in the technology to the point of having a premium market was this technology by the physics happens to also be the highest power density propulsion source on the planet. Meaning you can make a lighter weight propulsion source than any other technology out there, including batteries, lithium ion batteries, next generation batteries. And so there is this idea that someone will pay a lot of money for something no one else on the planet can do first. And if they can prove things out, including manufacturing, you could transform all of distributed generation, right? So that's one that aligns with venture. Another is, is actually in functional materials and, and functionalizing 3D printing uh, for structure materials and otherwise. There are two out of the six that we very quickly realized are not, clearly not traditional venture plays. And yet, there's still value creation. One of them's in the synthetic biology space, where our entrepreneur is taking all the lessons learned from first generation biofuels and saying, I can take all those lessons learned and make products cheaper, leveraging all the learnings and all the capital that exists out there. And they're now in discussions with a number of corporate partners for a essentially demonstration of the technology, which likely would lead, lead to those corporates funding the scaling and potentially acquiring. And two are actually somewhere in between, where it, it could go either way, and they're driving towards a first prototype. And what's been really exciting for me is we're finding right now, to Marianne's point, that there is a, a, a renaissance blooming to some extent. We're finding that all of a sudden there are a lot of different types of capital out there that can align with value creation and with technology without some of those constraints. And, and you know, these two are, are moving. Um, we have a new cohort of six projects that we brought in. I told the story about Dick Swanson. Uh, there are two guys here, uh, Mike McGee, who's a professor here at Stanford, uh, and Colin Bailey, uh, who was working with him here as a student. Colin's now in our new cohort working on uh, what we've discussed several times is probably one of the only problems as an entrepreneur working, worth working on in solar materials, which is perovskites as a next generation, high efficiency, very low cost solar cell. Um, 
And, and again, I think right now seeing opportunities both as building that as a traditional venture business or not. So, great. Some areas there. Well, well, great. Well, we have a few minutes left where you can open it up. I think we have a few microphones, um, but go, yes. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Gabriel. Um, I, uh, I'm involved with the uh, distributed renewable energy and fuel systems company. We build on and operate been around for a while. I have not heard anybody. I have not heard anybody until you said uh, that you invested in carbon reduction. Uh, we have, uh, we eat, sleep, and drink carbon reduction in many, many different uh, processes for years. And whenever we talk, we're self-funded, but we didn't want to be. Every, every time we mentioned carbon reduction, it was what our goal and what we did on farms, by the way, too. People eat, didn't get it, didn't know it, and we got nothing. Carbon reduction is the is the whole is the name of the game, but nobody is saying there is a a carbon reduction funding group or whatever. I mean, well, we're not funding carbon reduction, and we don't invest in carbon reduction. We invest in companies, yeah, who, if they're successful, will reduce CO two or the equivalents in right. the atmosphere. Right. That is the universe of companies in which we may invest. After that, it's yeah. an investment decision. So come talk to me, and, and you know if we come to the judgment that it's a profitable investment that meets our investment hurdles, then we'll start negotiating terms, and either you'll think we're too greedy and rapacious, or, you'll, or we'll do a deal. But I didn't say we don't invest in carbon reduction. That's something altogether different. We invest in companies, and we need a financial return. And that's, that, you know, but there are, there are some who view that as a, an area of investment. We're one of them, and I, I know a few others. Quite said the way you did. It's all. Oh. It's always been. It, it, we we. It's been spoken around. Yeah. yeah. No, we thought a long, long and hard about it, but that's that's why our investors gave our limited partners gave us their money to invest. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I had a, certainly had a question. Oh, do we have one from the audience? Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um. This would actually be directed um, either at um, Elon or, or Gabriel and possibly Marianne. <laughs> <laughs> <They're so friendly. laughs> well, the, the reason why is, is we have, uh, we're uh, a seed stage um, startup where we do actually have our own functioning low fidelity built in my garage prototype of uh, our device, which is specifically to transform the hydrogen fuel cell business into getting away from carbon releasing sources of hydrogen. Um, is ours the type of company that you would also look at? Uh, we, would well, look, I mean, we, would, point, we would look at it. What you I'm know, I, can, is, is we, I could rattle off a, a, you know, a bunch of questions that we would ask, and, right. but happy to look at it for sure. Okay, because I mean, we've got our functioning prototype and what we're looking to do is commercialize it at this point and then bring it forward into market. Sure. We'd look. Grab your, my card. Yours are the first companies, the first ones that I've come across in four years of trying to shake the trees that were willing to look at somebody who was actually making a physical product. Right. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's, that's discouraging. I, I, but I, I think there's more, than, there's more than just <laughs> the yeah. two of us on this stage. I, I, think, I can, yeah, there's exactly. A, I, I think it's definitely true that there is a shift towards software uh, businesses. I, I think that's 100% true. Again, a lot of those software businesses come with hardware. Uh, so I, I don't want everybody think, to think that there is just nobody investing in hardware. And there are still certainly yeah. many investments that are made that are in strictly hardware only. And so I don't want anybody in the room to think that if you're hardware, there's nobody in the world that will invest in you. That, that's but, certainly yeah, not true. I think that's <laughs> It's, it's just harder to find them. It's harder um, to find. And, and here's one thing that's really important. You have to, I mean, all of us, he's got, he's got a mission behind his fund. I have a strategic focus around my fund of, uh, around what we're doing in terms of accelerating the business. You still have to make money. So you yeah. might have a technology disruption, but you have to come pitch the economic value proposition, the customer who's going to care, why they're going to buy it. That whole case has to be laid out. 
Right. I mean, it's that's right. It's still a financial investment, and, and without commenting on either of your two companies, we will look. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean we'll invest, and it doesn't also mean that we're right to uh, to not right. to invest. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like that's neither right. of those things is, <laughs> is necessarily true. I, I would say, you know, the there are investors out there definitely who who want to fund, you know, hardware. Physical sciences, you know, even pure physics, right? The, the tough part is they tend to be scattered sometimes. You definitely have to come with a pitch that is, here's how I'm going to make money for you, right? To any investor, um, I think that's both the this fragmentation is both the challenge and the opportunity around what we've been doing, building with Cyclotron Road. Meaning, we wouldn't be able to support our innovators if we weren't able to find a group of investors and start to understand. Okay, here's how Prelude Ventures thinks about it. Here's what they're looking for. Here's how they make money. But here's also their strategic requirements, likewise GE. Um, and, you know, we've constructed what we're doing with help. You know, Gabriel's actually, you know, provided a lot of input on how we build out Cyclotron Road, as has Marianne in conversations over the years um, uh, and others. And, you know, it's, I just see here, you know, evoke, uh, for those who don't know, Mike Biddle in the room. Uh, a very new, really interesting fund with a whole different strategic mindset. Uh, you know, go meet Mike, figure out what he's about. Uh, I see Depender and Capricorn in here, right? We need that community, but we also need entrepreneurs like you to understand how to not waste your time and their time. Right. Yeah. Sorry, was there another question over here? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah I was going to just ask, I'm not going to ask you. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> don't want the, uh, oh, okay. It sounds like you all believe that what's going on <coughs> really is more cyclic than actually it wasn't a tulip um, tulum that now it's never going to come back. It's going to be coming back. It's a cyclic thing. Question one, what are the conditions that you're looking for you wish would happen that would accelerate bringing back an up cycle? What are those things where we get a virtuous cycle? And then the second is, if we get a virtuous cycle back, what do we need to do to make sure we don't go bust again on the back side of it? I just, I just quickly, I'd wonder whether we need a boom. Because, uh, I mean, one, one thing we've talked yeah. about a lot, you can say, oh, there was a huge cliff and fall off in investment. Or you can say there was an unnatural rise in investment. Right. And I Good think point. what we need is an optimal ratio, right? I personally believe, you know, the, the physical and hard sciences is not optimal, but I don't know where the optimal is. It might only be twice as much as it is now, but a lot better coordinated versus 10 times as much. I, no, I think it's an excellent point. I, I think that there, um, I, I don't think you meant it quite the way, but the word boom, I think, is something mm. to, that is worth picking up on. I think that's right. Too much money came in in sort of the late to, mid 2000s, very quickly with no proof points behind it. And then if you look, sorry to say this now, but if you look at the yield codes too, right, what mm. happened there was really over-marketing of the return expectation. And if you just really left it as a stable sort of um, stable kind of dividend growth return, you wouldn't have this implosion now. And so I think what you have is this need to sort of pitch things as high growth, this sort of incessant need to pitch things as high growth so that it compete with other classes of capital. And maybe we no. shouldn't be doing that, right? Maybe you're trying to find the right source of capital matched to the appetite and the return profile so that it's more yeah. stable. But, but those, are, those are standard investment cycles, right? That's just typical. Uh, you know, so what was different, maybe, and whether or not this should be, you know, first, we want to see more capital in the space, right? We want more early stage, more, more middle stage, more late stage investors. I can think of maybe one or two deals over the past five years that we have lost because we didn't move quickly enough. Right, and that's not a good thing, right? Like, there's very little time pressure on us, and so uh, a fellow investor said, and he wasn't being complimentary, he's like, oh, you guys are really deliberate. <laughs> um, but we have, there has been, we've been trained that it's okay to be deliberate over the past five years. So it would be great for, for there to be more capital investing. I, I think it's us. right. I do think more capital is coming in. And in, it's coming. In, in part because strategics are all but, ramping up. And I think because, uh, because there's little competition, I think there's some people coming in for that reason yeah. too. But I think the short answer to your question of how you get more capital is actually, unfortunately, wins, right? Yeah. And, and so one of the things, um, Sue Siegel, who leads the GE Ventures team, is actually speaking this afternoon. And one of the things she's going to be talking about 
is business models and, and multiples, right? And I think one of the things we haven't talked about here today is that if you look at companies that are being financially rewarded today, and we're talking about big companies, not just little startups that are getting bought up as aqua hires, the multiple on earnings or earnings, I mean, hell, they don't even have profit, so certainly on profit are much higher if there's this idea of some network orchestration capability, which needs, which is not part of necessarily fundamental scientific hard science dis discovery. And so we're in a market cycle right now where uh, investors are not seeing differentiated return in big companies off of fundamental science and technology invention. And that's what's causing the whole sort of multiple thing to cascade through. And so if that, when that dynamic changes, because the hardware is all the same and not differentiated, and there's a step breakthrough, then you'll start to see that change. But that's what has to play through. But the, the other thing that was different in 2008 and the first part of 2009 was there was a pretty big belief that there was at least a reasonable possibility of a price on carbon, right? That's right. And regulations matter, policy frameworks matter, utilities, chemical industries, oil and gas, you know, transport fuels, these are regulated industries and the regulatory framework matters. So if there was, right now, the, the regulatory playing field is probably not even level. For all the subsidies that exist for solar and wind, and we heard a little bit of talk about that in the great debate, you know, it's probably still skewed towards burning natural gas for your electricity, right? Um, so regulation and the regulatory environment matters, and that was really different until sort of the summer of 2009, 2010, when did the, when did the, that, the carbon bill die, right? That was a big difference. Well, I think we're, we're actually out of time for, for the panel. Please join me in thanking our panelists for joining us. Thanks very much.